didn't swab for DNA like we do now. And so unfortunately, that, that's something that is most likely not available to us. Yes, ma'am. Let me, let me answer that two ways. Number one, um, okay. Yeah, Ray, if you wanna come up. Um, so in 1960, when she was found, this community, the community of Prescott, rallied around her, uh, driven by KYCA radio at the time and some, some other local uh, folks involved in the church, and they raised the money back then to give her a proper burial. Uh, as for now, uh, her next of kin has been identified, so it will be in, up to them. It'll be their decision as to where she's reinterred. Uh, we did talk to them about that last week, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Chavez. So since we <coughs> just found out on Friday, um, we do feel a great, um, uh, we, we feel that the town of Prescott has, Prescott has really uh, been, <laughs> I mean, they rallied around her, so we feel type of an obligation, you know. We'd, we'd feel, we feel odd if we would take her away. But of course, we, we, we are gonna talk about it more with the family. Uh, uh, Sharon's brother is still alive. My uncle lives in Germany. And uh, Johnny Gallegos with his wife, my Aunt Petra. And so we're going to be doing a lot of Zoom calling. We're gonna be doing a lot of Facebooking and decide as a family what we want to what we want to do with her, she does have a few cousins uh, still around, and so a, as a family, we're going to decide what we want to do. Hopefully, we won't have to come up with that decision too too quickly. We definitely, no matter what, want to give her a headstone with proper name, uh, she and with her date of birth. Uh, she was born September the sixth, nineteen fifty five. So, uh, and share some stories about her. So we appreciate everything that's done, but uh, we're just asking for some time to think about what we want to do with her. Any other questions? Yes. Is this the oldest cold case that has been put across the case called today? Yeah, absolutely, yes. It's the oldest one I'm aware of. Um, we've got a whole bunch of people sitting behind you that uh, may have uh, information on some others. Uh, it, it's a huge task. That's why we have so many people that, that do that. And thank God for them that they are willing to do that. But absolutely, yes, this is the oldest one that we have solved. Yes, sir. I believe one of them is. Kristen spoke to him yesterday, so yeah, and that was. Uh, so he's 91 years old, and yeah. uh, soon, oh gosh, I'll get it. But um, I, when he first saw, forgive me, when he first saw the the uh, composite that we were working on this, he contacted us and asked if we ever did solve that he would call him. So I made sure that that our office uh, did call him, and he was very happy and very grateful. He is the last living uh, detective that was working on the case. And like I said, he was, uh, we wanted to make sure he absolutely knew this before, um, before anyone else, so. What was his response to your family when you first found it? Well, his first questions were, was it what I thought it was? And <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. sorry, I apologize. Yes, his first questions were, you know, was it, was it this? Because that's what I thought. But once uh, we explained to him who it was, he remembered Sharon, he remembered part of the the um, investigation back then, and I could I could hear in his voice that he was actually getting quite quite choked up. Yes, ma'am. Great question. 
Uh, actually, when uh, when Othram reached out to us and 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 you know one of the issues we have with DNA testing uh, happens in a lab and it's a very sterile thing, and so we we did have a case several years ago uh, that we sent off to a specialized lab in Colorado, and they were able to find some DNA that hadn't been uh, located before. Uh, we're hopeful that that will uh, bring us a result. But in the conversations I had with David and with Michael about this case and hearing the questions they asked, I told them that we, were, we had been planning a meeting for about the last two months. We have that meeting coming up tomorrow. Uh, there won't be any cameras uh, or reporters invited to that for, for reasons that I'm sure you all understand. Uh, but uh, David did offer to attend that meeting. Uh, tomorrow we're going over four uh, other cold cases. And uh, the purpose of that meeting is specifically to identify the cases and the evidence that have the greatest uh, likelihood that will to result in DNA that will help us solve those cases. And they've volunteered, like I said, to, uh, to come and attend that with us tomorrow. They know, obviously, you know, we love solving crimes, but they understand the science. Um, and so, uh, yes, we'll, we'll do that meeting tomorrow. We'll go over those four cases. Uh, we will do another meeting like that in another probably six weeks. I don't know if, if Othram will be able to attend that one, but hopefully we'll pick up enough information tomorrow to help guide that. But we, you know, when we started this cold case unit, it was back in 2010, I was the sergeant in the unit, Sheriff Rhodes was a lieutenant in the unit, and we recognized that we cannot solve these cases. Uh, there are just too many of them to devote current detectives who were working on current cases. And so luckily we were able to get you know, these, these folks over here uh, to come in and help us. And so the goal has always been to solve all of those. And hopefully we can, you know, we can, we can do that sometime in the next seven years before I retire. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Just want to clarify, just to read from your book, when was the first time that it was detected that it was somebody blood from the murder? So there's a newspaper article from August 5th that talks about communication between Yavapai County Sheriff's Office and Alamogordo Police Department and the FBI uh, talking about Sharon Gallegos possibly being, uh, you know, who we found. For the reasons I talked about earlier, the, the age discrepancy, the clothing difference, the decomposition, uh, she was, you know, when you're doing these kinds of cases, you have, you know, you've got a limited amount of resources, you have a limited amount of people, and a limited amount of time, you're trying to get the bad guy as quick as you can. So when you get information like, like we got back in 1960 from the FBI that said that that, you know, was not a match, then they felt it was most prudent to move on to other suspects. So that was the first time. Uh, it was about five days after she was recovered. Is there no? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, I know this body was buried for a long time. How, uh, I know the technology is really advanced, but uh, what's the process of any, how hard is it to extract the DNA that is usable? David, obviously hard. <laughs> David can probably tell you in more technical terms. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's pretty tricky, uh, especially using just any method to, to pull DNA, and, and more importantly, to pull DNA that's usable. So um, having said that, technology has progressed enough to where, from our perspective, um, the science is almost never the barrier in getting these cases solved. So from our perspective, we've got a, a process down that's pretty sensitive. We know up front if we're going to be able to help um, so we will triage cases. If we see a case that has uh, properties of DNA or evidence that we've seen before that we've successfully processed, we'll, we'll jump in like we did in this case, no matter how hard it was for anyone else because we know we can do it. If we haven't had a lot of experience, we'll ask people to wait and we'll develop some different capabilities to then take on the case. So we've done that for a lot of the, especially the child cases where they're a lot more complex to work through. Um, having said that though, once we get through the process and we know we can get involved, it's pretty straightforward with the, with the method that we're using. Um, again, tuned for only this one application. 
And so uh, science is not the barrier in getting these cases sorted out. It's generally uh, the tremendous amount of investigative work that has to be done, and then uh, sometimes the funding that needs to be secured, uh, which I think is really exciting because uh, technology is not the limit here. It's just getting enough people together that care and want to make a difference on a case. Um, I, uh, I, I, I really love, you know, I, I'm, we're big on family. Uh, my wife, my wife and I uh, have five kids of our own, and uh, and so I, I love the idea. Um, well, first of all, I do DNA work, and so I'm sort of a one-trick pony. That's all I've ever done. But um, but I particularly love the idea of helping uh, families, and and one of the the biggest uh, pains that can be caused to a family um, that's really hard to, uh, except for the last couple of years, make a difference on. Is, um, is helping a family that has had a victim of, of crime or, or, or a lost loved one that has never been found. And so, um, so the inspiration to do this work is to basically help get answers for families. And um, you know, I, I mention at every conference we do, no matter how old the case, there's always someone waiting. And, and, and what, what could be a more beautiful example? There's always family that's waiting for answers. The DNA doesn't last forever, it continues to degrade. It gets eaten up. I don't know if you guys know, but when you test DNA, you're consuming it and you're destroying it. So if you keep testing it, just using any old method, it'll eventually, you know, run out, and then the case truly goes cold. So I think, I think uh, I'm very attracted, as as is my wife and the rest of our team, to helping get answers for families, and and knowing that it's literally just a limitation of time and money. It just seems like it just seems like a terrible shame not to not to be in this line of work. There, there's no technological barrier. The science works. Uh, it, you know, if you, if you visit our site, you'll see this is this is. Believe it or not, not not exceptional. This happens every single time we get involved. We're able to help get answers for cases that are generally um, often half a century old. So um, I think that's optim You know, it's, it's exciting. It gives me optimism for the future, and um, and it's why we do what we do. Yes, I can uh, tell you about that. Um, growing up, we didn't talk about it too much as a family. I was probably 12 years old when I finally got the courage to ask my mother about it because I had heard. And then I said, you know, what kind of, what kind of, uh, how, wh how was she? Who was she? And she was feisty, very feisty. So I can understand why she didn't want to go with that lady who was trying to kidnap her. Um, she was very ha a happy-go-lucky, you know, regular, almost five years old. She loved playing with her cousins. And she, my, she lived with my grandmother and her two siblings and my aunt and a couple of her children. So there was a, there was a lot of kids to play with. Like mentioned before, my cousin Vicky, who was with her, they were actually playing outside at the time. And she loved to do errands of go around the block, go to the little grocery store, bring stuff back. She loved to do that. And a couple of weeks before she went, when she was kidnapped, she stopped wanting to do that. She was a little afraid to do that. So that, you know, nobody understood why. And now we do, is because she had seen them and they had scared her. But all in all, she was very jovial, very fun to be around. Uh, she had a nickname. Uh, my grandmother called her La Huera, which means uh, means she was really light light skinned, and uh, everybody called her that Little Huera because she had really light colored hair, light skin, um, and she just loved to be around my my mother and her brother. Her brother was ten, my mother was fifteen, and she was five, and my mother was like a little mother to her. Uh, in addition, because my grandmother worked a lot uh, to support her children, uh, but they had a pretty, you know, they had a pretty decent, decent life. So, what would be your message to those who abduct other children? My message to them would be why, <laughs> why, 
Why choose her? She was, they were there for a week or two before asking questions specifically. You know, why take her? And then 10 days later, she was found deceased. I mean, that, that, that for us doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't make any sense. I, it would just be terrible to lose a child. You know, my grandmother went through a lot throughout her life. My mother went, you know, always wondered about her sister. I always hoped I would find her by doing DNA testing, uh, you know, find that she was still alive. Uh, but at least we know now. And just, you know, the innocence of a child to take that. You know, why? Well, th it did shape our lives. My mother was very, uh, very protective of us. There was four of us. Uh, I'm the oldest child, uh, my mom, and then I have a brother, Matthew Chavez. I have uh, another brother who passed away recently, Philip Chavez, and then my sister, Monsi Podria, and she has children of her own. So we're very protective of kids. Uh, my godson, uh, Lorenzo Morales, I would not let him go to the bathroom by himself, even when he was 12 years old, he would get mad at his Nino. Why are you going with me? I will wait outside and wait for you to go to the restroom. We were very, very protective. We always were on the lookout. You know, my father was very, you know, make sure you're always aware of your surroundings. So it did affect us. It, it, it did affect us. And like I said, we, it kept revisiting us throughout our lives. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of pieces to it, and I think I think we'll probably end up talking more uh, after the press conference. But you know, we're looking at information, uh, so much more information than was previously looked at before, um, and so it's just it's. I, I could spend the rest of the day, and, and then you guys would fall asleep and not get watched. <laughs> but it, 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 it's such a. It's, there's not even a. The only thing that makes it similar. The only thing that makes it similar to other kinds of testing is the fact that there's the word DNA in it. It's so wildly different. And I actually brought uh, my my team over to to chat with everyone because it's so different, it just warrants its own conversation, but I, but I don't want to take away from, uh, from the story. So we'll be hanging around after the press conference to chat more about it. It's, uh, it's just wildly exciting stuff. Well, there's, there's, there's something that I'm just going to point out. There, before, before DNA became widely used, um, the only tool you had really available to you is, is what they call like anthropological analysis. And so that's where you have specialists look at like skeletal remains and look at bones. Um, based on the shape of the bones, um, you need certain bones to be able to make ascertainments of whether someone is biologically male or female, um, how tall they might have been. You could even try to guess ancestral origins. But I guess what I'll say is this, is that the analysis uh, was all that was available at the time that these tools were utilized. And it relies on a very, it kind of segues to the earlier question. Anthropological analysis relies on a small number of data points from which you can make a guess about height, age, everything else. The, the magic of genetic testing is that we're collecting you know, hundreds of thousands of data points. And so there's just so much more information. And so the information that you can get with the newer tools that weren't available in the 60s and the 70s and in the 80s and even in the 90s 
are, are, are tools that provide just a lot more precision. So it's not that they necessarily got the wrong age, it's that the spread is so large and then it looks confusing. You might say this kid could have been between three to nine years old, three to seven, but, but the truth is, it's just, you know, so it's kind of like a camera. You're looking, you know, through a, through a long range camera. And it's like a blurry picture, but as technology improves, you get a clearer and clearer idea. So I don't think anything was necessarily wrong. It's just, it was either inconclusive or just not specific enough to lead investigators to say, without a doubt, this is the actual person. If that makes sense. Yeah, I got it. I mean, the ones the body they found here were being captained, but they were it was too small to be they figured it wasn't the liquor or the thing that happened. I, I think that's a question maybe you guys can answer. I mean I saw some video. I'm I'm just the DNA guy. <laughs> So the, the, the anthropological comparison that David just talked about, so in 1960 in Prescott, uh, that was done by the funeral home director at the, the funeral home that she was taken to. Uh, so now, even, even though now it's still an inexact science, and he talked about measuring certain data points on, on the skeleton, um, but back then, they didn't, you know, the tools weren't what they are now, and even the medical expertise wasn't what it is now. We use a uh, forensic anthropologist out of Maricopa County, who that's all she does. And so, but a lot of that is because the science has advanced enough. So back then in 1960, it was, you know, they, you didn't have these kinds of cases in 1960. Uh, people weren't as mobile as they are now, so. Am I right that they thought that the girl that she was driving to have kidnapped, that the one here they thought was younger or not that? The age estimation for for the the body that we found here was older, so oh, that was I part of that, I got that one. So that was part of the reason they discounted. Okay, that, that, that was, oh, I had it the opposite way. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. There's one newspaper account written in, uh, I believe it was July or August of 1965 in Alamogordo that, that mentions that one of the two children, I think it was the older one, the 11 year old, said that there were two other kids in the car when that car pulled up to kidnap Sharon. That's, yeah. So how many people do you believe do you have left to try to solve? A bunch. <laughs> Actually, it's very good that we didn't even have to talk about that a little bit. But we want to make sure there aren't any other questions before. So in conclusion, we hoped that what you would get out of this press conference is uh, sort of a cross-section, some transparency of how, how this is done. It is a, it's a conglomerate, it is a community endeavor. You have to bring uh, everybody together to speak for those who can no longer speak for themselves. And all the experts, all law enforcement, all uh, anybody, all the online sleuths, everybody that's out there that's interested in these old cases, uh, keep working on them. Never give up. That is my message to, to everybody because you can have results, you can have success, and that's really um, what we're going to keep doing. And to answer that question, there are a lot of cases here in Yavapai County. There's a lot of cases around Arizona and a lot of cases around this nation that still need to be solved. A lot of families that are still out there waiting for answers, uh, and I'm confident that we're gonna continue to get answers for them. So thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. It's uh, great to see such a turnout.
And once again, everybody with the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office over here, fantastic job. Thank you guys very much.